is up in the world today, huh? Mad Jeff that I'm here to stay, huh? Can't get rid of me that easily, no. I'm just riffing. What? I know. I be freaking myself out sometimes, yo. I'm your host. This is the Mad Jeff Music Show. I'm Jeff Taylor. Dig it. I'm really excited about today's show, and I'm gonna tell you why. I'm gonna tell you why. I'm gonna tell you why. I got a guy on my show today, but uh, dude, this dude right here, he's straight up what they call a rock star. Okay, that's a rock star right there, and we're gonna get into that rock star thing because that is Mr. Kevin Bow, and Mr. Kevin Bow is coming to the show. I'm so excited about that. We're gonna get to that. In just a minute, but before we do, before we do, before we bring Mr. Bo on the show, let's get into a little um, uh, news. Uh, how about that? Let's get into our little news today. What is the news you say? What is the news you ask? Well, let me share some news with you. This is the news today. <laughs> Future the rapper is in the news over Lori and Steve Harvey because he put a little this in a in a song on a mixtape or a new all a new record by 42 Doug and the little diss was like yo tell Steve Harvey I don't want her no more or something like that craziness I, you know and this is Lori here on the right obviously that's future the pretty one on the left but none of my business again but he said in his song tell Steve Harvey I don't want her and I, and I found that to be interesting and and uh you know here's the deal Here's the deal. She has moved on. And in case you didn't know, she moved on with Michael B. Jordan. And hey, coincidentally, I just have a, he's here. He wants to talk to us. Michael's, Michael's here. So Michael's got something he wants to say to future. Song by future. Mm, send him on in. I got a new beat. I want to play for him. Uh oh, future. This might not be good for you. Oh, ah. Ooh, damn it. This is Lori Harvey. This is Lori Harvey right here. And she's beautiful, and they're beautiful together. So you got to leave them alone, if you don't mind, Mr. Future. It's okay with me if you just leave those people alone. Anyways, man, that's all there is for news I want to share with you today. Right now, I really, I want to bring my guest in right now. So who is my guest, you ask? Uh, again, my guest is Mr. Kevin Bow. Kevin is a music producer out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And um, he's done some, some serious work, man. His career has spanned you know 30 40 years i guess man and he's put some some heavyweight records in with johnny lang and this guy's worked with leonard skinner like who can say that these days etta james i mean on and on and on and on I, i'm really stoked to have him on the show he's a songwriter producer and everything like that let's get him in the shot right now Let, well, let's just welcome him to the show ladies and gentlemen this right here is mr kevin bow sir we are honored to have you here Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it so much. Kevin, how you doing, buddy? It's so good to see you. You know, this is actually the first time we've actually ever come face to face. I know, which is weird because you know so many people in common. It's just, I guess we've been like circling each other for a long time, you know. Mind blowing, you know, and it's funny because people will say to me in, in various studio settings, have you ever met Kevin? I'd be like, no, nah. they'd be like... It, it, Kevin's funky. He's a bad dude. Have you met Kevin? I'm, no, I haven't met Kevin. Where's Kevin? And I'm always expecting this big six foot four black dude to come walking out of the uh, into the room, and then that'd be Kevin Bow because in my neighborhood that would be Kevin Bow. But you're Kevin Bow. I'm so excited to have you on the show, Kevin. <laughs> you know why we never met? It's probably because I go to bed so early. I do go to bed so. Early. That's why we never met because you go to bed so early. So let yeah, me ask you a question. Man. Let's just jump right into this, bro. You are a Minneapolis dude. You are. You are. You were, you were so behind the scenes that I was all over Minneapolis and I never saw you, but you were making dozens and dozens of records every year. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I started getting busy in the uh, early 90s. Before that, I was busy not being busy. <laughs> but it's the early 90s, I got a, a lucky break um, that got everything rolling. I was... Uh, uh, seeing a woman who owned um, the the fine who'd opened the Fine Line Music Cafe in '87, oh. and then she sold her out her interest in that, and we got married. We stayed together. We're still together. Have our 30th wedding anniversary in June. Well, um, thank you. And uh, <laughs> anyway, so she was uh, she got uh, 
Prince hired her to build a club for him called Glam Slam in the early 90s, very early 90s. And I was doing an opening gig as usual because I was never like overly burdened with success as a live performer. Um, and David Z was in the audience and he saw my band playing and that was it. Uh, he kind of gave me the talk. Uh, the, and it, in shorthand, it was... Singing them, you could make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, he took one of my songs uh, and gave it to put it on the first Kenny Wayne Shepherd record and it went platinum and I quit my last day job for life so thank you David Z <laughs> that's amazing man and uh, let, let me ask you a question what, what got you into music I mean how did you when did you start why, why did you become a music producer I became a music producer because I was failing at being a rock star and I tried to become a rock star in the beginning because I wanted to meet girls you wanted to meet girls. Well, that's interesting because I've heard similar stories from you, but incidentally, <laughs> I have this clip here. I'm just going to run this for you real quick. Just tell me if this... History uh... to begin with. I was small for my age, oh. and I liked reading and hated <laughs> sports, so you do the math. <laughs> the playground was not kind to me, um, and I needed something to get some uh, social power. Right. So I started, when I was 13, I started... Uh, playing guitar and being a drug dealer oh. <laughs> and the guitar thing worked out really well uh the drug dealer thing not, not so much yeah, I, just don't <laughs> I found that very interesting and very revealing can you expound <laughs> can you expound no i mean in all in all seriousness i mean don't we all didn't we all pick up the guitar for the first time just because we wanted to be cool right totally and then if you're the, one of the people that stays with it or music in general it's yeah. because along that way you actually fall in love with making music yeah. for life, you know what I mean? But my motives in the very beginning were very impure. You know, I, I saw The Who, I saw Pete Townsend, not a very good looking guy, figured he still had, was knee deep in coke and women. And in my stupid 13 year old mind, I thought, that's for me. Um, and the drug thing, I, I quit the drug thing and I've been completely sober since 1979. But, um, but I never put down the guitar uh, and just kind of built on it. From there but you know your motives change as you grow older um i i stopped trying to be a rock star in my 30s and realized that um that's not david z really helped me realize that's not why i was put here i was put here to help other people do their thing and that's what i'm best at and some of those other people are like um ghost hounds uh, young johnny lang i mean you've produced some records and you've won some awards haven't you I mean, you've won, you won a couple Grammys with Johnny, didn't you? Uh, well, I wrote songs on Grammy-winning albums for Johnny and Etta James, but you, that's not like the same as winning a Grammy because you're, if you're just a songwriter. But um, uh, well, I, let's here. put it this way. My, my Grammy is on paper, and I had to pay him for it. <laughs> it it wasn't Grammys a on my show, bro. <laughs> but I'll take oh, it. Awesome. I mean, the, the real thing isn't the awards uh the fun of doing it and the money you know what i mean because the money is more honest than the rewards because the money means people love your music enough to pay for it which is an increasingly rare thing as you know yes. um so that's the real award is when regular people hear your record and love it and and, and will and and pay to you know put it in a film or tv show or um or or, or play it on spotify or whatever that's the that's the that's the award well, one thing I've noticed about you, listening to your music, following your career a little bit, looking at your, your bio on Discog, I mean, you put a lot, you put a lot into what you do. I mean, you, people come to you because you put a lot in there. I mean, from the engineering all the way through production, I mean, every aspect of your records are like top level. This is top level production. You know what I mean? And how, where does that stem from? I think from? that comes from doing it for a long time, number one. And number two, um, <laughs> this is the question I always ask, what else is there to do? Yeah. I mean, this is what I love to do. Right. My work is my hobby and my social life and my fun. Um, and and I'm, my kids are grown. I mean, I'm actually babysitting my granddaughter tonight. Not doing a very good job of it because I'm sitting here hanging out with you. But oh, well. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, my, it's, it's my whole life. Um, I never get tired of it. Even working on a silly record that I know nobody's ever going to hear. I mean, I think part of it is because I never made a living at this until I was like 32 33 so maybe i appreciate it more than yeah, some people who you. you know 
As a matter of fact, I'll tell you, so you worked a lot with uh, Zumi and Terry. Yeah. So the day I got my first publishing advance and quit my last day job, that very day, I went to this big bank and I was depositing my first year's advance. And I, the whole big bank lobby was completely empty except for one extremely good looking, very well dressed black man. And I looked at that man and it was Terry Lewis. And I didn't know him and he didn't know me, but I looked at him and I said, Mr. Lewis, I just wanna say I've always been a fan of yours and it's really kind of amazing I'd run into you today because this is my first year publishing advance and I'm putting it in the bank and I, I'm quitting my day job. And he looked at me no without missing a beat. And I'll never forget this because it was one of the greatest moments of my life. <laughs> he said, see man, now you're getting paid. Me, I'm all about getting paid. <laughs> and it, it, stayed, well, it stayed with me. Well, you know, all of those guys are all about getting paid because, well, they, they had dealt with not being paid so at the highest level exactly. of the game. So, I mean, bro, I complained about not being paid on things on a much lower level. And those guys, those guys were at the top of the game, bro, and they weren't getting what they deserved. It was a moment that I'll never forget. Well, speaking of which, you signed a publishing deal with, with like, uh, Stoller. And Lieber yeah, Lieber and Stoller, the guys who wrote Hound Dog for Elvis. For Elvis. That's incredible. So, so they they boy, that, they were made. They were raining in checks forever, huh? I guess. Oh and my then, God, good Lord! <laughs> and then they signed. Yeah, G going to uh, to meet them when I first signed that deal. That check in my hand when I ran into Terry at the bank. That was my first year advance from Lieber and Stoller. Wow. Um, and uh, I yeah, working f for them for four years was amazing. Just the stories. Yeah, I bet. Were super super. There was very funny men. And they come from the Tin yeah. Man Alley era, the, you know, the Brill building and just kind of showing up in an office and rotating singers and songwriters and so forth until you can craft a hit, essentially. So you come from that school in a sense, huh? Which is... In a way, in a way, like, uh, I certainly, um, you know, there's, that's the tough thing about Minneapolis. I love Minneapolis because there's so many great musicians here, so many great sounds here, so many great bands, but it's not very much of a songwriter town. Most... Anyone in Minneapolis who's writing songs is writing them for themselves. Right, right. But people like me who write songs with and for other people, there's not very much of a scene for that. Gotcha. And um, it requires a different mentality. Like, I'm not the kind of guy who wakes up at three in the morning and burns this incense and, like, <laughs> I'm going to get inspired to write a song now. Um, when I'm writing for a project, I write every day. You know, I found it interesting that one of your projects was with little Steven Van Zandt, who a legendary <laughs> East Street band member. Those guys, bro, were those legends, man. These are legends, man. How's a guy and like that who the with nicest and call you to come and work on his record? Why you? Uh, little Steven, so that's a, a this is the, why they call songs the real estate of the music industry. So I had this song I wrote for Etta James called The Blues Is My Business. And Etta cut it, and then, like, for the next 10 years, there must have been 150 cover versions of that song. Every like band full of like old fat white guys with a blues band mm -hmm. <laughs> playing at the Bunkers type bar in their town, you know, of Poopville, Maryland or whatever, they all recorded it. A couple of them even licensed it and paid me for it. But anyway, um, so that song became kind of a, a chestnut. And um, even the, the U.S. Navy Band of Liberty covered it. Mm -hmm. I have the CD. That's incredible. So anyway, then it got used on The Sopranos, and little Steven was an actor on The Sopranos. Yes, he was. And he heard the song, and this is 20 years ago, but he never forgot it. And so then he was making a record a couple of three years ago, and uh, he covered it, and I never even heard from him. They, you know, they don't need to talk to me to cover my song. Right. But a friend of mine texted me, did you know that you're on the new little Steven album? I said, no. Yeah. And I Googled it, and there it was. And so then I contacted him on Twitter, and he's a big Twitter guy. And he got right back to me. And he was like, dude, I love your song. Let's meet. So when he played in Minneapolis, I went backstage and met with him. And he's just the funniest, nicest guy that's ever. Nice. Isn't that weird? That is. That's something. That's something. And he was definitely in The Sopranos. He didn't wear his do-rag in there, but he was in that movie. I remember him. He had his No, he was wore a big, fat-ass toupee. Yeah, so it's like, it's one of those. That was great. So, so songwriting, man, I mean... Remember those days? Songs. 
Well, I made a living all through the 90s as just being a songwriter, and I don't think you can do that now, except for maybe in Nashville. No. Nowadays, um, it's so, like, no. Yeah, you got to be a writer, producer, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and which is great because I love producing and engineering and mixing, but I only started doing that stuff seriously around 2000, relatively late in life. Okay. Wow. And it wasn't an artistic decision. It was a survival decision. Right. But then after a couple of years, I was like, oh, my God, I like this, and I'm getting okay. to be pretty good at it. So it's kind of fun now because every day is different. I'm sure it's the same for you. Like one day you're writing, the next day you're producing, the next day you're playing on a track, the next day you're mixing, the next day you're editing. So it never gets boring, you know, because you 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 have so many different jobs. Yeah, and I'm just happy to be able to, to do the creative things. I just like to do the creative things. You know, keeps, exactly. Keeps me alive. Keeps me alive. And it never it's never boring. Let me ask you a question. You're working out of your – you have a studio in your home out there in Minneapolis? But you got I nice do. You got, what kind of board you got in there, Kevin? No board. No board. I got a bunch of uh, a bunch of pre's, a bunch of Neve API, the same stuff as everybody else. Distressors. Um, I did just my superstar vocal mic for a long time has been a Bach two fifty one Sound Deluxe two fifty one. But a friend of mine just loaned me a brand new U sixty seven, and I'm excited to try it. This is your studio? Is that your place there in the background? No, that's, I think that's an IPR, but I do love that picture. <laughs> me too. It's very menacing. I came across this picture. I was like, Kevin's going to freak me out when he comes on the show. I, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna have to hold on to my hey, hat when Kevin comes on the show. Then you said you were sending a body double, and I was like, oh, God, man, we're going to be riding together, brother. My no, sometimes guy. you got to keep those session guys in line. You know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely, man. Trust <laughs> me. I've been that guy. A lot of people hate me for that very reason. But um, hey no, man, here's like another that. guy you worked with that I thought this was pretty significant, man. This is a heavyweight too, man. Al Cooper. Well, yeah, no, I, I, I never worked with him, but he okay. picked one of my songs that I wrote nice. for Tommy Castro to be one of his like he does this list every year of fifty favorite songs. Okay. Um, but we we had a bond because we both worked. We're two Jews that worked with Leonard Skinner, and that's a very small club. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, then you, and then there's a uh, Paul Westenberg. Now him I worked with quite a uh, quite a lot. I toured with him, uh, and our friend Mike Bland was on drums. Um, we did a two month U.S. tour, Bland. and then I produced a couple of things on him too. There's Bland. Yes, that's my guy. Great guy. Yeah, great, incredible drummer too. <laughs> a great guy I would say and an incredible drummer. What about that? It's impossible. His beat is so dominating. His groove is so deep. Oh goodness. It, it's impossible to be out of time with him. In, impossible. You're a bad musician if you can't play with Michael Bland. Yeah. On drums. Yeah. His snare, are, yeah. His snare is actually his snare is actually fatter than the width of your guitar, so it cov the snare covers the. Whole <laughs> he was and you know he was he. pretty much always that good because I I started uh, jamming with Michael when he was 14, straight out of church wow. band. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah he, that's and he was. I mean, he, you knew even back then that he was he was already Michael Bland then, really, yeah. which is kind of amazing. What do, you, what do you think about these guys, though, man? These guys are back. They're coming out on tour. The Jonas Brothers. This is a band you should, they should call you up to produce their records. I think you could you could hit home runs with these guys, bro. Well, my friend John Fields produced their first uh, few records, and okay. I don't know that I could do a better job man, uh, dope. than that. But it's funny. I didn't take them that seriously back then, but uh, a couple of things they've done lately um, I really liked. But when they were like a, a boy band, right. I wasn't I wasn't as, as into it. Um, I, I appreciated what John did with them and stuff, but it wasn't my jam. But a few things they've done in the last few years, I was kind of like, hey, yeah. uh, started taking them seriously. But my tastes have really opened up over the last few years because in the 80s, I was like, punk rock is the only good music. You know, I'm, right. of course, that's when I wasn't making any money and I was broke and and uh, I was just really opinionated. And now, you know. I love BTS, One Direction. I love Bread. I love the Carpenters. I love the Bee Gees. I love Reggae. I love Deep Purple. I love uh, Sia. I mean, you know, I'm, the more things I find to love, the more fun I can have. Yeah, so definitely. I'd rather like music than, you know, than not like music. I'll never be a new metal guy. I feel you. That's not that I can't do that, but like I, there's there's so much music that I love. You're now. a rock dude. You're a guitar dude first, and I, I I got a question. I wonder if you've ever recorded a synthesizer for any of your projects. Oh, every day. Really? 
Oh yeah, I was make fun of my guitars as they sit there in the corner now. I'm like, I don't make any money off you guys anymore. Oh. So you're saying, yeah, then that's sad. Come on, we gotta. Okay, I'm, let's do this, man. Let's uh, let's get back to guitars. Let's force everybody back to guitars. Let's just force them. Well, I am working heavily. The ghost towns you mentioned, they're out of Pittsburgh, and I've been yeah, spending a lot of too. time in Pittsburgh over the last three years. And that's a Rolling Stones style guitar band. Definitely, they're hard. No <laughs> sense. They're hard as hell. I yeah, yeah. Show on YouTube, they're they're hard. That singer, that singer oh, is amazing. Back. What's his name? Trey Nation. Trey, yeah, Trey Nation is his name. Yeah, he's just he's amazing. But um, now I'm working on Courtney Hadwin's new record. Um, that's not public yet, but. Um, She's, you know, that when she was 13, she sang the Black Crows, Otis Redding actually oh, song, Hard to Handle on the nice. British Singing Contest. Yeah, and that, yeah. little 13 year old skinny white girl, and she yeah. sings like Janis Joplin, everyone went crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So she got signed to this label and they hooked us up and we've been writing together, like COVID writing, remote writing. She's in England. Okay. And uh, there will be guitars and synths on that record, nice. happily living together. <laughs> That's a beautiful thing. I mean, because they do go together, and I, I've, I've always put them together. I always have in R and B. Oh, totally right. Yeah, oh, yeah, they, they work. They work for me. How about this young fella here, man? Now, you were, you were heavily involved in the career of this young fella right here, man. I mean, come on. Yeah, man. we did two records together. Um, where um, I actually had a gig up in Fargo in the early '90s, and uh, met him. He'd only been playing guitar for nine months, and I don't think anyone else from Minneapolis had seen him yet. And uh, we got to be friends, and he thought I was super cool because I had already had a song cut by Kenny Wayne Shepherd. But I knew the minute I saw him play, he was only 13, I was like, dude, you're going to be way bigger than Kenny Wayne Shepherd. No. Um, so we started writing songs together then. And, um, oh, remember that cute little haircut? <laughs> ha, ha, ha. He looks like Princess Leia there. Anyway. I don't think he um, me to show that picture right there. I just have to. <laughs> yeah. I like, like t-shirt, Johnny. Up. T-shirt. Um, but yeah, we I had a, a, a couple songs on his first album and four songs on his second album, and they both went double platinum. And that um, that was a super fun project. It was really great. The there whole Grammys through. involved there, right? For the second one, I think, yeah. Okay. But that's <laughs> that's a a best blues album Grammy, which I always tell people that a blues Grammy is like getting a Christmas card from your rich uncle with no money in it. <laughs> It's funny and that's really sad and true though it's, it's funny true. and a little sad it's a little sad i mean it really <laughs> is when you think sad. about it because hey you know what i grew up as a youngster in buffalo new york and one of the things i got to see really? as a very young kid at nine years old was little lucky peterson they used to sneak this kid into the bars he was 12 or nine i don't know and he was and he was a blues fanatic at nine years old they would sit him in there, pop him up on a bar, and serve alcohol all around this little kid. So a similar thing to Johnny Lang, and later in life, he, he can't even get a gig, bro. He, and he's phenomenal. He's phenomenal. Sad. So he went through rehab when he was like 14. And oh, Lord. <laughs> Blues ain't no joke, man, because you got to drink hard, man, to bend those four strings at once. I don't know what it is about that life, but it's a rough life. That blues life is a rough life, man. It is. Uh, I have... Uh, I like to write the songs, but beyond that, um, I mean, I don't live that life. I'm yeah. sober and happily married, and <laughs> I just, but I do love that. I still love that music. Um, I just yeah. finished a blues record, first like blues record I've done in a long time with the Ghost Towns in Pittsburgh. I just finished it today, as a matter of fact. And we did a Lightning Hopkins cover mm -hmm. and a, a, a bunch of other cool songs. And it was all, not, no, no click track on the album, all recorded live couple of harmonica overdubs um and it was really fun mm -hmm. i haven't done a record like that in a long time that's awesome and davina Ooh, uh, what about davina and uh savages is what's davina and the uh, vagabonds the vagabonds big campy music but you're you're that's kind of seems like a, a stretch for you but maybe not i don't know i, I only i just wrote a song with her like okay. one time okay. i didn't end up d doing any work uh, with them okay. but that kind of music i think it never goes away people People always like it, you know what I mean? They might not buy the records, but they like to go see them in clubs and stuff, you know? Here's a good record, man. You heard this one? This is uh, Crawl Like a Man by yours truly there, Mr. Kevin Bow. And this is, a, this is a great song. 
this is a, if radio was what it's supposed to be 15 years ago, this is a smash radio hit. Right? Yeah. This is all through California as you're driving down Melrose. This is blasting out of the out of the car window. And Kevin, you wrote this song. You wrote this for your group. The Okima Prophets, the yeah. The Okima Prophets. What's up with yeah. that project, man? How's that going? It's not. I'm done. No, oh. I might I might put out one more record, but, you know, as a producer, I'm my own worst client, you know? I never make any money off of my stuff, um, so I do it just for fun. But I really got a lot of what I wanted to get out, out already, mm-hmm. um, especially with that record. That record, that whole record is... Um, a complete labor of love. You know what I mean? It, it feels good um, too. But I feel like I did it. I don't need to do it uh, again. But um, I still love the songs on the record, but that music is hopelessly dated. Oh. Well, it's cr- you crafted some songs there. I think I think films and television is going to find a use for more of your songs in the future. I mean, Sonic the Hedgehog, did it, one of your songs made it into that soundtrack, didn't it? Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, that was a good, uh, yeah. that was a good little payday. You're in good company. I'm glad I know you, man. That's a legendary Lieber and Stoll. I mean, come on, man. And so you, you, I, you, I know you're not old enough to be in that same mold as them, but just having that influence of them throughout your career is, is something that a lot of young people will never, ever get a chance to experience, even if they're. I suppose the you're right. With the biggest, you know, publishing company there is, they're not going to get. They're not going to feel the, you know, that outreach of two people who have been there from the very beginning doing the thing that you're aspiring to do helping invent it. You know, the Lieber and Stoller were the first people to get credited with the term producer. Really? Because they were writing these songs and every time they let the label do them, because back yeah. then the A&R person was kind of the producer. Yeah. They didn't have like producers. They had engineers, but not producers. And so yeah. Lieber and Stoller got it in their contract that they got to be in the studio mm. and determine how the, how the song was recorded. And the label said, how do you want to be, Atlantic Records said, how do you want to be credited? And at first they said, like movies, they said, we want to be uh, with the director. Right, right. And they said, no, we can't give you that for whatever reason. They said, okay, how about producer? And they said, okay. Interesting. Isn't that funky? That, that's a, that yeah. is a tidbit of information that I'm happy that we have just discovered. I had no I'm idea. I'm telling you. And now guess what? Everybody's a producer. <laughs> no. Remember when, remember when that started to happen? You'd be like, you'd be teaching a class, right, at IPR. We both taught at the Institution of uh, Institute of uh, 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 recording and uh, production. Production, and, uh, yeah. You have all these students, and you know, and they graduate, and then when they graduate on a, a year from now, you bump into them again. You go, "What are you doing?" Well, I'm booking sessions across town, or I'm over here producing, or I'm the producer over here. I'm a producer. I'm producing. you're like, "Well, damn, everybody's a producer now." And something happened in the, in the in the two thousands where literally there was some there was a few good producers, and then the entire world became a producer. They're adorable, aren't they? It's amazing. It really is. You know, they're cheap, I guess. They're affordable by billionaires. And uh, so, therefore, the music industry should suffer. Yeah, they can have that. That's fine, because I ain't cheap. I, I always say, I'm old, but I ain't cheap. Same here, brother. I'll be like, no, I'm going to hold on until you come to your senses, is what I'm going to do. Man, Kevin, what's what's the future hold for you, brother? What's What's going on in the future? Lately, for me, the future is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, because uh, the ghost towns, they're going to keep me busy for much of the next year. Um, and this guy who's behind the ghost towns is also producing some other things, uh, film film and TV uh, things that I might be, uh, I'm lo- I hope to be helping score those things. So lots of work for me in Pittsburgh and then the rest in Minneapolis. Well, man, I wish you the best, bro. I really do. And it's an awesome thing that you would take time and come on my show. I really feel like we've always known each other. And next time I'm in Minneapolis, I really hope I can talk you into having a little cup of coffee or something together, bro. I'm easy to find. That would be great. That would be fantastic. I'm going to look you up. I'm gonna look you, you do up. it. Thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate you, brother. One love. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Kevin Bo, and he's headed out. Ah, fingertip love from Kevin Bow. Man, I'm so stoked when I have a guest like that on the show. And I hope there's young people out there that tuned in and learned a little something about the history of like the business and music and how it all relates to you and as a songwriter, as a producer and so forth. There's things you could learn on the Matt Jeff Music Show. Hey, but guess what? I wanted to tell you about this real quick. My next guest, oh, on Tuesday the 25th 
Miss Ashley Dumas is coming to the show. She's out of Minneapolis as well. I love Minneapolis. I'll be reaching in there because it's a talent pool so deep, my people. The talent pool is so deep. This is Ashley. She's got a hot single out right now, Superstar. And guess what? She's coming to the show. I'm excited about that. Hey, guess what, man? You can get me on social media. I'm not a hard person to find. You can find me on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, yada, yada, bada, bada, all those places. Look, I hope you'll support my store and my efforts to continue doing my show by supporting me on my online Shopify store where you can download some sample CDs or riffs and drum hits and samples and all kinds of cool stuff that you can flip into your music. Dig it. It's really that simple. Just go to the store, scan that little code. It'll take you right there. While you're there, you will find some books that I've written as well in my journey. They're like PDFs. They're smaller books. No big deal. It's not, gonna, not like a bazillion pages, but there's information packed in there. That, I guarantee you. Having said all that, man, I'm so happy that you guys could come to the show. Again, I'm your host, Jeff Taylor. That's me. Yes. And before I go... I just want to say one thing, because this is very important to me, as you know, and that is that we all be healthy in this time of uh, confusion in America and in the world. We don't know what's going on. UFOs are real. Uh, you know, the racism is real. There's so much stuff that's backwards. So people are confused. I get it. No money. I, got it. I get it. There's so many reasons to want to hurt yourself or do something that probably would let some people down in your life. Don't do that. Instead, call 1-800-273-TALK. And talk to somebody about the things that are bothering you. Maybe somebody can help you, talk you down, or put you in, lead you in a situation that will get you some help and, and make you feel better about life, man. You know? Because I love you. You know, I love you. And this is the Mad Jeff Music Show, and we need to spread love. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to start on my own by spreading love. And I'm going to do that by bringing cool people to my show, introducing them to you, like Mr. Kevin Bow talking to you about them, let them introduce themselves, bring them out from behind the curtain, you know. Anyway, that's all I got. I ain't got no more. It's time for me to sign off. So, having said that, good night, world. Oh, on your way out. This is fire. So don't burn yourself. Back up against the wall. Fine. Slide out sideways. Peace. See you on Tuesday.